Did you rest well? I just saw the evening news. And they talked about cosmetic products. Right now, K pop is sweeping the world, right? Together with dramas, it's called Hallyu, the Korean wave, right? Right now, riding on this Hallyu wave, Korean cosmetics are now spreading all around the world. They call it K beauty. K beauty? There's a global recession going on right now, right? When a recession progresses, the demand for cosmetics rises, while the demand for other services and goods falls. The experts call this the lipstick effect. When men or husbands have to go out, be it for work or in retirement, the wives have to go out to do their things too. And of course, they can't go out right away. They must put on some makeup. That's why cosmetics sell well. That's something we talked about yesterday. Currently, the cosmetics market in Korea is about $8.5 to $9 billion, but is expected to increase to about $11 billion. The reason for that is that many tourists from China and Japan come to buy cosmetics, and they look for good products with low prices. So, an expert in cosmetics said on the news yesterday, that if a cosmetic product is good and affordable, it'll surely sell well. All of you will be able to make money from the cosmetics business because I don't think the recession will end soon. Our economic growth doesn't solely depend on ourselves. Our economy cannot grow without relying on foreign markets because we have no native resources and the market is relatively narrow. Jobs are created and earnings are distributed only when the economy grows, right? Then the question is, how does the economy grow? You can learn that in college, but I'll show you right away. For those of you who don't know, it's okay to think, I guess so. This is how the economy grows. You'll get to know the meaning of it right away. Why is the national income called GDP or GNP? GDP means gross domestic product. The establishment of the GDP and the price of goods in the market is always driven by supply and demand. Therefore, GDP is determined at the point where the aggregated demand and the aggregated supply are in balance. Then, what happens? C is consumption. I is investment. G is for government budget expenditure, X is export, and M is import. When you watch the news, they keep talking about economic growth problems and job problems. Saying things like, we're worried because consumption demand is falling. For the GDP to go up, there has to be a lot of consumption. This is called the paradox of thrift. If one person is frugal and saves, that person can become rich, but if the entire country is frugal and saves, the economy will collapse. Let's say you all wear old clothes and rubber sandals. Don't even buy ramen and eat only rice and miso at home. All Korean companies would go bankrupt, right? Let's say you don't even go to the hairdresser and your spouse cuts your hair at home. All hairdressers would go bankrupt, right? Let's say you don't drive cars and just walk everywhere. What would happen then? The whole car industry and the recharging stations would go bankrupt. All the wheel manufacturers would go bankrupt too. Therefore, the biggest problem in the current Korean economy is how to increase consumption. The reason Japan's economy has been in recession for 20 years is that people don't spend. There's no consumption. In Japan, people in their 60s and older have almost all their money in assets. It's mostly real estate, and they have assets and financial income. But those elderly people don't spend it. On the other hand, young people in Japan want to spend money but don't have it. 
So to overcome this problem, what did the government give out? It gave out money to spend, but they didn't spend it and instead put it in savings accounts. That's why the economy is getting worse. Then, if there is no consumption, what would make the economy grow? There's growth if investment goes well. However, if consumption doesn't increase, entrepreneurs won't invest. Only by consuming and selling, there's investment, right? If consumption falls, investment falls at the same time. These two are called private demand or private expenditure. Then, if the private sector doesn't expand, who can do it? The government does. This is government expenditure. So in times of recession, the government spends 60% of the budget in the first half or increases the aggregated demand by increasing the demand for market consumption. However, government spending has to be based on tax. Of course, they can make a deficit without paying taxes. The government can make money by issuing government bonds and selling them on the stock market. But that becomes government debt. Right now, Greece and Spain are struggling due to their high government debt. Tax isn't being collected, but they keep issuing bonds. And that's why those countries are on the verge of bankruptcy. In addition, you can't just increase government spending. So what must we do to have economic growth? X. The economy will grow if there are lots of exports. Exporting means that domestically produced goods and services are not consumed by Koreans, so who consumes them? Exporting is consumption by foreign people. In the end, it counts as consumption too. Since importing is our people consuming, products manufactured overseas, our income gets spent overseas. So, if you subtract that, there we have the national income. So, what has been driving our growth so far? Our growth engine has been exports. Although the domestic market is small, exports have increased continuously, leading to growth. But what is the EU doing right now? It's in trouble because of financial issues. Demand is falling. American economy isn't doing well right now, too. And it's the world's biggest market. For us, the biggest market is China. And the situation isn't great there as well. There's a possibility it'll have a hard landing. A soft landing is when an airplane lands well at an airfield. It means it landed with no problems. A hard landing is the opposite. It just hits the ground. So our economy goes back and forth depending on whether the Chinese economy grows 1% more or 1% less. It depends on exports to China. Then what does the government want to do? To increase consumption. Investment will increase accordingly as consumption increases. Our economy is now one that is leaning toward demand instead of supply. After the Industrial Revolution, if there is demand, there is supply. What I want to say is that production is slow because nobody is buying. Then, how should the income be distributed? Those who already have an income above a certain level don't increase consumption just because income increases. Let's say someone eats three times a day. Would they eat six times if their income doubles? Of course not. There's nobody like that. In general, after one's physiological needs are satisfied, there's no need for more consumption. So, what must happen to income to increase domestic demand? If the income distribution of the low-income class is increased, domestic consumption will increase sharply and the economy will be revived. Who benefits from this? The entrepreneurs? Because they sell their products. It's a win-win for everyone and creates equity in income distribution then all of you present here today are patriots. The greatest patriot is someone who makes lots of money and pays taxes to the state. If you only get benefits from the state, it could be burdensome to your country, right? Living while being a burden to someone is not a beautiful way to live. However, those who don't have the skills and don't have the ability to live on their own should be supported by the state, right? should receive public social transfers. This is social security. That's why patriots are those who earn lots of money and pay lots of taxes to the state. Are there any greater patriots than that? People that raise their fists shouting democracy? More than a person who fights for women's rights by raising their fists, someone who builds fridges or rice cookers help the women's rights movement way more. People who planned those fridges and the rice cookers in labs helped women's rights more. It's useless to talk about patriotism every day. A real patriot becomes successful 
earns a lot of money and pays a lot of taxes to the state. That way, the state will be able to give public social transfers to people with physical disabilities and elderly people. I hope you'll feel your patriotism after this lecture. Especially for those of you who earn a lot of money. To those who still earn a small amount, I hope you reflect on how you still can be more patriotic. As K pop sweeps the world and Psy gets more popular, many people say he finally made a career out of it. But this wasn't something sudden. He applied the so called 10,000 hour law. He's been training to the death from the bottom for 12 years. That's how he became successful today. That's what experts call the 10,000 hour law. In other words, the impossible is not possible without at least 10,000 hours of hard work in order to be remarkably successful. Let me tell you, neuroscientists that specialize in the brain are figuring out why now. No matter how genius you are, you can never succeed without working 10,000 hours or more. This is an incredibly fair law, right? If the time needed varied according to IQ, there would probably be a lot of people resenting their parents. This is something unrelated with IQ. Regardless of talent, you can't be successful without putting in more than 10,000 hours of hard work. What I'm going to talk about today is the broken window theory. The broken windows theory has been renamed the broken window law by business experts. The first Atomy 7 ups is dress up. This not only means clothes, but also keep things neat and clean from head to toe. I'm not asking you to wear luxury clothes, just neat ones. This shows your sincerity. The second one is clean up. You must clean up your body and mind without forgetting about your environment. It becomes a broken window if you don't. People will throw all the trash away. If you're messy, others will be messy too. That person's character worsens. That's clean up. Although it seems like a small thing, Small is powerful. Small things are very powerful. Show up. Don't stay locked up in your room. There are still many people that haven't come out of their houses. Why are you locked up in your rooms like that? Only by meeting people, you'll be able to recruit some and get some energy from them. That's show up. Just show up. It can be your center or even on the streets. You must meet people. You won't accomplish anything just by being in your room in front of your computer. Shut up. Don't talk too much. What do I mean by this? To listen to others. The former chairman and Samsung founder Pyong Chul Lee passed on his fortune to his third son, Kon Hee Lee, right? The first time Chairman Gun Hee Lee went to work after being appointed vice president, Chairman Pyong Chul Lee immediately called him to his office. He wrote something in front of him, and that has become the motto of Chairman Gun Hee Lee now. He didn't say anything and just wrote one word listen. Don't talk and listen to others. That's why Samsung is doing so well. Next one is pay up, pay all of your debts, and don't take more loans. There are no successful entrepreneurs that run their business on debt. Never do business in debt. Royal Master Pyonggu Lim didn't have the money to buy a set of cosmetics, so he borrowed his son's pocket money and bought it, right? What would have happened if he had borrowed money? It wouldn't have worked. Cheer up. Have energy and courage. This business is impossible without them. And last, never give up. Never give up and give your all until the end. I call this the Hodo mentality. Hodo mentality. Do you know writer Wesu Lee? It appears in a conversation log between writer Wesu Lee and monk Hemin. The monk Hemin asked him, Young people nowadays face various difficulties. What is the most important mentality they should have? Writer Wesu Lee answered, They should have Hodo mentality. Thinking it was a very philosophical term, the monk asked, Oh, what is that mentality? It's the mentality of holding on for dear life until the end. It's very important to hold on until the very end. The broken window theory was experimented by Professor Philip Zimbardo of Sanford University in 1969. He recently had visited an abandoned school in the countryside and he was surprised at finding all the windows broken. 
There wasn't a single intact one. None of the blackboards were properly attached. He had no idea who took them all off. All the desks, chairs, and windows were broken. That's where this term came from. Philip Zimbardo, a famous professor of psychology, did a very impressive experiment in 1969. He prepared two cars and left them unattended in an alley with poor security. He raised the hood of one of them and left it unattended. As for the other one, he also raised the hood but broke one of the windows. Although both cars were identical, the one with the broken window had its battery stolen only after 10 minutes. After 20 minutes, another person took the tires. After a week, it was bare bones with only the frame remaining. The US is like that. They'll sell all of it. On the other hand, the identical car with the hood open was left alone intact. This is the broken window law. What happens if you leave a single broken window unattended? The whole house will fall apart. This is the broken window law. The broken window law states that the whole organization will collapse if you don't fix the small things. But Professor Philip Zimbardo's experiment was forgotten as time passed. However, 12 years later, these two professors, Professor Wilson and Professor Kelling, published their thesis. There is a lot of crime in New York City, and they theorize its origin with the broken window theory. These are quotes from the thesis. Let's consider a building with several broken windows. If those windows are left unrepaired, people will break more windows. After all, if there is no owner of the building, they may break into the building and live inside of it or burn it. Everyone, go to redeveloping areas. If people leave, there won't be a single intact window. The walls are collapsing and there's even fire damage. That's how it turns out. Probably many of you have experienced this. Let's consider sidewalks. There's some garbage piled up. Then soon, more garbage accumulates there. After that, people will start throwing takeout garbage bags from restaurants and throw out the garbage from their cars. This thesis explains that. In other words, murders, rapes, thefts, and robberies that happen in New York City won't be solved by catching the criminals. But if you fix a broken window, although it's a very minor thing, the crime will go away. After this announcement, the experts were divided into two groups. That's nonsense. What does cleaning garbage have to do with murder crimes? People who murder, rob, and rape are by nature that way. And it's not something we can solve by getting rid of trash. Other experts believe that this was a groundbreaking theory in crime prevention. That's what happened. However, it was discussed and forgotten too. Later, Rudolph Giuliani became mayor of New York City. And he had a hard time due to the high level of crime. The subway was the most affected place in New York City. If you visited America then, people would tell you not to take the New York subway. It was due to the high occurrence of crime there. However, if someone tells you not to do something, you want to do it, right? If you took the subway from the station premises to the inside and outside of the subway cars, it was a spray graffiti hell. And the homeless drug addicts were laying down with their eyes wide open. It was really scary. That's how it was. It looked like this. Can you see the graffiti? This was the inside of the subway station in the waiting areas. It looked like this everywhere. Can you see the sleeping homeless man? This is how it was. Then, how could Mayor Giuliani get rid of robbery, murder, and rape? He discovered the broken window theory and started applying it 11 years later. What did he do first? He started cleaning the subway graffiti. But people criticized his actions. The mayor is just erasing graffiti and doesn't intend to catch criminals. But he was so adamant about it that trains with graffiti were not allowed to operate. 
That's how strongly he enforced it. Do you know how long it took to erase it all? Five years. Then, what happened? Violent crimes fell to less than half compared to the past. Mayor Giuliani said, If you can't stop people crossing the crosswalk when it's red, you can't stop the thieves either. If you just leave minor misdemeanors as they are, those eventually turn into crime. A minor habit becomes common and a needle thief becomes a cow thief getting worse little by little. So, unless you catch the crime in the very early stages, you won't be able to get rid of violent crime. That's why he started clearing up misdemeanors. In those times, if you stopped at a traffic light, a fierce person would come suddenly and spray your front windows. Why? Because then he asked to clean your windows. Even though nobody asked for it, he would wipe once and then ask for money. What happened if you didn't? He would spray black paint all over your front windows. You wouldn't be able to go on. You couldn't. So if that person came and cleaned your windows, you had to give them money. You wouldn't be able to drive with the front windows all sprayed on. It was hard to erase, too. Those were the crimes he started clearing. The ones who crossed with the red light, the ones who threw trash at people, the loud drunk people, and the ones who pissed everywhere. They caught them all. And they applied zero tolerance without forgiving a single person. By clearing up misdemeanor crimes, violent crimes began to disappear. This shows how it went down in New York. There was a lot, but thanks to Mayor Giuliani, it fell down like this. In other words, Violent crimes are a big problem that starts from very small incidents. You may think, why is it so important to dress up and worry about your appearance? It is very important. It influences your first impression, and like Joe Girard's Law of 250 states, a person won't try to meet you again if you get a first bad impression. No matter what you say to them, they won't hear a word. If you're someone who throws trash anywhere, others will throw their trash there too. What will happen to your first impression? That person will not want to deal with you. That's why he was named Person of the Year by Time Magazine. By catching misdemeanor crimes with such a simple theory, violent crimes were also eliminated. He was even knighted by the Queen of England. For what reason? It was because of this. Do you know the 9-11 terror attacks? Al-Qaeda did this with two planes. And civil engineers, architectural engineers, and physicists learned a lot from their actions. At first, engineers thought that if a plane crashed here, there would be only a fire. Have you ever seen a movie called Towering Inferno? In that movie, the building was on fire but didn't crumble. But when it happened in real life, the building came crashing down. However, physicists wrote that if only one building had collapsed, engineers would still be divided on it. They would say that it wouldn't collapse even if a plane crashed into it. But since both towers collapsed, they reached the conclusion it was the likely result. Even Al-Qaeda only wanted to set them on fire and didn't think they would collapse. However, when jet fuel burns, the temperature rises by thousands of degrees. The buildings have a steel frame, right? When it goes above 850 degrees, the molecular structure becomes brittle and weakens. When it gets weak, it can't bear the weight and collapses. And when the upper floor collapses, it hits the lower floors like a hammer. Power is multiplied by hundreds of times when you hit something with a hammer. Because it was hit like that, the floors were hit harder and harder and it collapsed to the bottom. So Al-Qaeda taught us something that even Nobel Prize winning engineers didn't know. This was really unexpected. If you go here now, there are two beams of light pointing towards the sky. It symbolizes these two buildings. They call it Ground Zero. Mayor Rudolf Giuliani was the mayor when this happened. Leaders usually panic when things like this happen. But he appeared on TV three consecutive days speaking very calmly to the people of New York and without any panic at all. Let's go back to our daily routines. Go to Broadway, watch a musical, and do some shopping.
That's how New Yorkers were freed from the panic. So more New Yorkers started watching musicals on Broadway. More people resumed shopping, and they returned to their normal lives. Upon seeing it, the Queen of England gifted him knighthood. Who would steal a bicycle if you tie it like this? It's completely tied up with iron bars. But I get why. I got two bicycles stolen from my apartment. They took them in a flash. I locked them with padlocks, but I have no idea how they took them so fast. In the United States, the so-called apartments are buildings that were only three or four floors high when I was living there. There was a student who rode his bicycle to school, and he locked his bicycle to a security window. One morning, the security window was gone. They even stole that. The University of Groningen in the Netherlands did the following experiment. Was the broken window theory correct? They left the bicycles like this, and they taped advertisement stickers on the handles. They even took the closest trash cans. They did two different experiments. The first one was leaving the bicycle on a clean street, and the second one was leaving it on a messy street. As there were no trash cans nearby, they had to do something with the stickers, right? One out of three owners of the bicycles left on the clean street littered the sticker on the ground. Thirty-three percent. However, in the case of the bicycles left on the messy street. The percentage of littered stickers was now 69%. So if the streets were dirty, they would just throw it away. However, if the surroundings were clean, their actions followed suit. That was the experiment. Human behavior changes depending on the environment. Then they did another experiment. Was that really the case? They did a money envelope experiment. They set up three different scenarios with the mailboxes. The first one was a clean mailbox, and they cleaned the surroundings too. There's a plastic part in the mail envelopes where you can see the address, right? They put five euros in the envelopes in a way the money could be seen, and left it on top of the mailbox. They wanted to see how many people would take it, so they prepared three experiments. One was a clean mailbox in a clean environment. Another one was a clean mailbox in a messy environment, and the last was a dirty mailbox in a messy environment. If the environment was clean and the mailbox was clean, thirteen out of a hundred people would take the money envelope. But if the surroundings were messy, it would double. In addition, twenty-seven percent would take the money if both the mailbox and the environment were dirty. This is what happened in developed countries like the Netherlands. So even though those people are little different from us, they would take the money because the environment was so messy. If you look at the mailboxes around the world, I think the Korean one is the best one. Although Americans put a stake with the mailbox out in front of their houses, they still have mailboxes like this in the city. The Belgian mailbox is the dirtiest. It's surrounded by graffiti. Here we have the Taiwanese one. Here's one from Italy, UK, Egypt, India, Spain, Finland. Since India was a British colony, the mailbox looks similar. Let's talk about broken windows in Atomy business. The broken windows are not a major problem, but even though they are minor things, it could end up with huge consequences. In everyday life, a hundred minus one equals ninety-nine. Mathematically, but is a common view among experts that in business the result is zero. In other words, if you did a hundred things right and one thing wrong, the company will go bankrupt. A hydrofluoric acid leak happened in Kumi City, right? You would need many scientific patents to produce that hydrofluoric acid, right? The facilities are great and clean too, but the window was broken when the workers there didn't follow the safety rules. What will happen to the company? Will it survive? It went bankrupt. Why? The government agreed to cover the expenses, right? All the fruit orchards there are dead now. 
then they probably won't be able to process the livestock. Is there anyone who will buy beef from Gumi's hydrofluoric acid leak area? Even if it's not harmful to health, it won't sell at all. And the biggest problem is the health of thousands of residents. Doctors don't know what's going to happen in the future since they were exposed to it and there have never been such a case in the past. So who should compensate for that? First of all, the government decided to compensate for the actual expenses and the government decided to claim the right to indemnity from that company. Would that company survive? In addition, the companies around them suffered huge losses from production disruptions, right? The company has to cover it all. Therefore, the company went bankrupt because of the single reason that employees were not trained on safety rules. The most frequently cited example by American expert is Kmart. Do you know it? It was a place that rivaled Walmart and was founded at the same time as Walmart too. But Walmart went on to seize the opportunity and Kmart went into court management and declared bankruptcy. Experts say that if Kmart had spent only a tenth of its money it spent on advertising and interior decoration on employee training, it would be doing just as well as Walmart now. But their employees were unfriendly and arrogant. Nobody went to their stores. The goods were great and cheap and didn't have any difference with Walmart. But their employees were unfriendly and arrogant because they weren't trained properly. People didn't go and that's why it went bankrupt. That's why Kmart is often used as an example when talking about the broken window theory. If they had spent a little bit of money to train their employees on service, it wouldn't have gone bankrupt due to that small problem. Atomy has a resolution on betting practices and a code of ethics too. Breaking them is breaking the windows. If you break it, you don't only break your own windows, the whole organization collapses. You're rejecting principle-oriented thinking and profit-oriented thinking. Don't engage in personal transactions between members such as recruiting, changing lines, or registering a borrowed name. This is part of our code of ethics. Atomy members do not engage in any financial transactions with each other, regardless if it's in cash or card other than direct transactions with the company. You may think that doing it by yourself won't have repercussions, but it does. If you break a window, others will follow your example. That's what happens. Atomy members thoroughly ban and drive out various promiscuous acts that may cause social problems such as inappropriate relationships during business activities and drinking. Atomy members do not deliberately practice betting, lower prices, dump, or make unnecessary purchases that prevent consumption and sales. Next, network marketing is being rewritten by Atomy. In other words, we need to get rid of all the bad practices that have existed so far and anyone who does them even a little is the same as breaking their own window. If they don't fix it, all the windows will be broken. Just like in Philip Zimbardo's experiment, if you break a window, 15 minutes later someone steals the battery, 30 minutes later the tires are taken, and a week later only the frame will be left. Ethics is not something relative, it is absolute. The broken windows of contractors. There can be many examples of this. Acts that pollute the environment, throwing trash everywhere. When it's easy to just take it with you. I see a lot of dignified people every time I pass by a certain street, but they put cigarette butts in the holes in the wall made to let water out. If they throw them to the ground, the cleaners would take them away, but they go out of their way to put them in places that are hard to see. Last time on TV, a cleaner from a national park was complaining about people who would bury their trash in the sand when he could clear it easily if it was visible. They would even hide it under the rocks in places that were hard to reach. That's a broken window. If one person does it, another will think that it is fine to do so too. If that happens, the whole company collapses. I talked about the next point on sloppy looks, right? Laziness, procrastination, all of them are minor problems. These little problems can become broken windows. Please think for a moment if these problems have become a burden to you in achieving your life goals. The 72 to 1 law. Experts research this law that states that if you don't put into action a decision made with your mind and heart within 72 hours, the probability of success is less than 1%. It must be put into action within 72 hours to be successful. Don't just make up your mind. There is a saying that states determination lasts three days, meaning that you won't be able to finish something if you don't start it within three days. 
In other words, let's divide studies into three categories, cool head, warm heart, and busy hands. Cool head and warm heart are very important. You need to know something to make a decision with your heart. However, if you don't put it into practice, it's of no use at all. The best example of this is riding a bicycle. What happens if you theorize it? If it seems you'll fall to the right, you turn the steering wheel to the left. And if it seems you'll fall to the left, you turn the steering wheel to the right. You have to keep pedaling not to fall. It's useless even if you think about it for a hundred days. You don't need to theorize it. You learn to ride a bicycle by just scraping your knees falling over and over again. Once you learn to ride a bicycle perfectly, you can ride it even if you haven't done so for 10 years. Isn't that right? If you don't learn to do it, you won't be able to ride it in your 80s. I have a friend like that. When he rides a bicycle, he doesn't pedal, he pulls it with his strength. He never learned to ride, and he won't ride properly because of that. If you don't put it into practice with your body, you'll never be able to create a habit of it. Your cells need to recognize it. Therefore, no matter how much you listen to a good lecture here, no matter how much you realize the possibilities with your mind, no matter how much you decide with your heart to be successful, if you don't put it into practice, your chances of success is less than 1%. That's the conclusion experts have reached. In other words, learning through your body is best. Ji Sung Park only played soccer, but in what language did the reporters interview him? In English. How about Yana Kim? In English too. They learned English because they needed it while being a soccer player and a figure skater. That's why wise men know that winning against yourself is more important than defeating others. Even if you don't want to, the most important thing is to put it into action. This is something that appears in Lao Tzu's Tao Te Ching. What is written in Lao Tzu's Tao Te Ching is the following. What are these Chinese characters? In the Chinese classics, it refers to talking to another person. Another person, someone sitting across from you. Knowing others is what is known as wisdom. Knowing what kind of person your sponsor is, what kind of person your partner is, what kind of person your spouse is, what kind of person your friend is, knowing what they hate and love is to have wisdom. You need to know what kind of person the other person is so you don't act recklessly, matching your actions according to that person. This is what having wisdom is according to the classics. In other words, knowing about atomy is to have wisdom. Only by having wisdom you'll know and it's wise to know other people. Then, knowing yourself is described with these Chinese characters. It's hard to pronounce. What is to have self-knowledge? It's to be bright. Only those who have light in them know who they are and not those who have darkness. Bright people know themselves. A stupid man wouldn't know himself. Back in my days. Of course it's himself, right? Next. The strength of winners. Strong people win against others. Strong people win against others, and weak people can't overcome other people, right? It said the strength of winners. Then what about someone who overcomes themselves? He would be the strongest of all. Someone who overcomes themselves is a real strong person. Someone who wins against others is just strong. But someone who overcomes themselves is a real strong person. Who is successful then? The strong. We're not talking about the strength to win against others, but about how a person who overcomes themselves is strong and can succeed. It's something minor, but small is powerful. And in conclusion, 
is the strongest of all. Someone who overcomes themselves is a strong person, and that strong person can be successful. I look forward to you becoming the number one salesman in Korea. Thank you.